Greetings everyone and welcome. Welcome back to the final session of this webinar on applications of remote sensing to soil moisture and evapotranspiration. Uh, we've had four sessions already. Um, this is Amita Mehta and I have Erika Podest here as well along with Elizabeth Hook and Amber McCollum. Uh, we, today we have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Hain from NOAA. He presented uh, this morning um, and we are going to play a recording of his presentation this evening. Just to remind a few things, um, we have posted uh, homework assignments on our website. The first assignment was already posted a um, week ago and today uh, you will also find the second assignment posted on the website. So those of you who have attended all five sessions and have, will complete both homeworks will get a certification certificate of completion uh, after a couple of months. Again, just a reminder, this is our website. Um, all the material that we present here uh, and the recording can be found at this site along with all the homework assignments. So please visit the site if you need any information. And this brings to our uh, last session of this webinar series. So we have two parts today. The first part uh, about LXC evapotranspiration, which is based on GOES and MODIS, that will be uh, presented by Dr. Christopher Hain from NOAA. And he we are going to play his presentation, which was recorded this morning. After that is done, we are going to have a second part that's going to talk about evapotranspiration and soil moisture data available from land data assimilation systems uh, and also uh, how, to use, how to access these data by using NASA web tools and the focus will be on then uh, looking at this data, downloading them and working with uh, in QGIS to do further analysis. So that will be a demonstration of data access. So with that, um, we will start with um, Christopher Haynes' presentation, and that will be about ET and soil moisture data from LXE. All right, so, all right, good, that's there. All right, so yes, I'd like to thank everybody for um, uh, attending this uh, seminar. I'll give a, a nice 30 minute overview of some of the work that uh, we've been working on with our Alexi evapotranspiration model. Um, uh, just here on the front page, you'll see a list of our, our, our group. Um, there is myself, Christopher Hain, uh, and Lee Fang and Mitch Shoal, which uh, we all work at ESSEC at University of Maryland and also our visiting scientists at NOAA. And then Martha Anderson, Martha Anderson and Bill Kustis and their team um, at USDA, uh, Hydrology and Remote Sensing Lab in Beltsville. And then uh, Jerry Zahn at NESDIS, uh, Jason Otkin at Wisconsin and Thomas Holmes at uh, NASA Goddard. So I will kind of just walk you through essentially an overview of, of our modeling system, uh, which uses remote sensing observations of land surface temperature and vegetation to get at uh, evapotranspiration and some of the applications that we have developed uh, based, on, based on our model. So just kind of to give you a, a, an overview of Kind of two of the different ways that uh, we fundamentally map evapotranspiration, and as you see here on on the on the on the left here, um, it's your typical water balance method. Um, it's more of something you'll see in, a, in an NLDAS or a GLDAS, where you have a land surface model and you, you you use parameters to try to describe the land surface and the interaction between the land surface and the atmosphere, and then uh, you try to model essentially the, the, the evapotranspiration. Uh, these models are mainly driven by precipitation and your ability to represent all the physics. Um, kind of call that a prognostic modeling approach. Um, so for, for our application, we use more of an energy balance or a diagnostic approach where we use observations of land surface temperature, uh, available energy at the surface, and uh, a representation of the vegetation. And we kind of ask the question, you know, given these known radiative inputs, how much water loss is required to keep the soil and vegetation at the temperatures that we can observe from satellite? So we don't need to know any knowledge of precipitation or other things. Uh, it's more of a, a diagnostic approach where we really look at that change in land surface temperature that we observe from satellite and, 
and are able to then calculate what the, uh, the surface energy fluxes are. So, you know, the two methods, uh, they're very different, but they, they're two independent ways of kind of getting at the answer. Um, they both have their merits and their, and their, their issues. Um, I won't tell you one is better than the other. Uh, there are good land service models and there are good diagnostic service energy balance models. Uh, so our goal is to really try to get a sense of uh, when they are good and when they are bad and when we, when we should prefer one method over another. So this is just kind of a, a rough uh, schematic of the uh, Alexi system. Um, you see here on the, on the left, uh, there are essentially two, parts, two components of the system. Um, it's based on a two-source energy balance model where the soil and the vegetation are represented uh, separately. Um, and then we uh, couple that with an atmospheric boundary layer model here on the right. And that provides essentially uh, the, the closure um, so we, that we don't need an actual observation of air temperature at the blending height. That's what really limits some of the, some of the other methodologies, a single source model or other two source models, where if you have a, a disagreement between this temperature at the air, or the blending height, and your surface temperature you observe from uh, satellite, you can have some issues with uh, accurately representing the surface energy fluxes. So in Alexi, uh, we add this energy balance closure, uh, this, uh, this boundary layer closure, to help with the two source model that we internally are able to diagnose the, the, the temperature of the blending height and have consistency between what we're seeing from a satellite and then what is occurring at that blending height. Um, so uh, that, that occurs by you know, taking an early morning sounding of potem potential temperature and then we have our, our change in land surface temperature uh, in the mid-morning and then we're able to calculate how much sensible heat flux is needed to, to raise the boundary layer height based on that initial Estimate and then these two met these two components iterate back until we have a, a convergence, um, and then that is the end of the, the iteration loop that produces uh, the surface energy fluxes that we then use to calculate evapotranspiration. So as I was saying, so this is this is a comparison we recently did, and this is kind of a highlight of kind of just showing you some issues between prognostic and diagnostic methods. Um, what is nice about diagnostic methods such as Alexi is that we don't need to model or represent things like irrigation, uh, vegetation tied to groundwater, um, other non-precipitation water inputs or outputs into the system. Um, we see all those inherently in the land surface temperature signal. Essentially, if, if the land surface temperature is heating up faster, you're dealing with dry soil, soil or stress vegetation. Uh, and vice versa if you have wet. So what this is, is we ran Alexi versus a land surface model that does not represent any of these non-precipitation water inputs. And then we calculated essentially just the average difference between those. So as you see, there was large differences in the, the Central Valley because the NOAA model didn't know that there was irrigated agriculture there. Same with the Snake River Valley in Idaho, the Mississippi River uh, Valley, and then some other signals along the way, some up in the upper Midwest. Uh, and then we kind of tried to tie those to some of the uh, some other data sets that can represent uh, essentially you know, irrigation percentage, how high is the water table. Um, and as you can see, the two, the, two, the two maps here are really well correlated where we're seeing the differences. And it kind of just really highlights the, the ability of diagnostic methods based on land surface temperature to diagnose the correct physics uh, of some of these non-precipitation water sources that have to then be added to uh, more of your prognostic methods. Um, and those are hard to add because it's not always that we'll know how much uh, water is applied in an irrigation cycle, or we may not always understand the, the groundwater dynamics in a certain region. So we kind of like to highlight that as this is a way of saying, you know, these methods sometimes are different, um, and, and diagnostic methods have a nice added uh, capability of, of, of really capturing a lot of things that need to be modeled a priori in, in a land surface model. So this is kind of like our uh, a schematic of our whole modeling system. So Alexi is run on usually the global to regional scale. So anything from MODIS to geostationary, uh, usually from 1 to 25 kilometers. Um, so we really call this a multi-scale system because we are able to use the model to produce regional fluxes 
using geostation, geostationary data and some polar data, which I'll kind of highlight later uh, how we're finding ways to use polar data even without the temporal resolution that we get from geostationary sensors. And then when we have higher resolution data from Landsat, aircraft, other uh, capabilities where we have field scale, we're able to then use the regional scale and then to act as a boundary condition for the high resolution. And we have a disaggregation tool called Disalexi, which produces essentially uh, evapotranspiration on the field scale. So it's a fully coupled uh, multi-scale system. Energy is conserved across all scales. And so that we can actually then, you know, when we run on the regional scale, the global scale, we can really drill down to the field scale and have everything, uh, you know, maintain energy conservation across all those scales, which really allows us to, um, well, it's important that we have the high resolution data because that's where we actually validate the model too, because um, you can't compare necessarily a four kilometer or a 10 kilometer pixel to uh, an eddy covariance flux tower. You really need to get down to that tower footprint. Um, so not only is really the actual information needed on the field scale, but it really allows us to validate the model um, much more correctly than dealing with some of the scale mismatches you have between larger uh, pixels and uh, flux towers. So another thing that uh, Martha and her team have, uh, have been developing is essentially ways of finding ways to offset some of the issues with uh, a 16-day or an 8-day overpass of Landsat. Um, obviously, we don't have information. Uh, here is an example where on one day you have a Landsat 5 overpass, and then you have a Landsat 7 overpass. Um, but using uh, a tool that Feng Gao at USDA has developed called STAR-FM, um, it's a data fusion machine learning methodology that takes essentially daily overpasses of MODIS at one kilometer, finds statistical relationships between MODIS and Landsat, and then between Landsat overpasses, it's able to fill in field scale estimates using machine learning so that we can represent, try to represent some of the, some of the issues that may happen in between Landsat overpasses um, uh, in, you know, oncoming stress or precipitation events that would be missed, um, but uh, that may be missed in Landsat overpasses. So it really allows us to fill in a much better picture um, than you would have with just relying on an eight or 16 day overpass from Landsat. So I'll just quickly go through a couple uh, of validation exercises at the model. Uh, I think it's important to show that the, the model does compare well to surface observations. Um, so we, these were uh, three field campaigns. Uh, SMEX02 was uh, uh, corn and soybean fields in uh, Iowa. Barrex is a uh, irrigated cotton, I believe cotton field in uh, the panhandle of Texas. It's a highly invective uh, regime where you have a lot of dry air over running uh, irrigated agriculture. So it's a very, it's a very difficult uh, issue when it comes to energy balance modeling. And then Mead is a uh, agricultural site in Nebraska where it is corn and soybean and there is irrigated and non-irrigated and then fields that are rotated each year. But as you see, for the most part, when we validate the model, on the field scale, uh, we have relative errors in the 8 to 12 percent. And most good energy balance models, that's kind of what you're striving for. Um, you know, there's always going to be some inherent uncertainty. There's there's closure issues with the observations. You know, flux observations are not a direct uh, observation. It's not as easy as going out and measuring the temperature each day. Uh, it's a difficult process. So there is some inherent uh, error within the observations and then obviously within the modeling systems too. So, you know, Five to 15 percent errors are really what we're striving for, and, uh, and that's what we saw here on these field campaigns. And so this kind of highlights, uh, this was a, a rain-fed soybean field during SMEXO2. Um, what you see here is these red squares are Landsat overpasses. So as you see during a large part of the growing season, we didn't have any uh, Landsat overpasses, but we did have a lot of rain events. Uh, so if you look down here on the bottom plot then, if you had just used Landsat and then just conserved whatever evaporative fraction you had at this day and just conserved that to the next Landsat overpass, you would get essentially a cumulative ET with this red dotted line. Um, when you use the data fusion where we're using MODIS to try to fill in some of that information that we're missing on Landsat overpasses, you get this red solid line, which traces very closely to the the solid blue line, which is the observed DT from the eddy covariance flux tower. 
So you see, you know, just by just by not having the temporal resolution on, on the Landsat observations, you see that it can lead to a lot of inherent error because you're not able to observe what's happening. But you know, with moderate resolution thermal data filling in uh, with a data fusion package and, and the machine learning, we were able to try to represent some of that information we were losing at the field scale. And these are just a couple more examples from uh, Bushland, Texas, and, and Mead. This was the Bear X08, and then this was uh, Mead. Uh, as you can see, for the most part, once again, you know, good agreement between the data fusion and the observations at these three sites: uh, an unirrigated cornfield, and an irrigated cornfield at Mead, and then an unirrigated cotton and an irrigated cotton. Uh, so you see, we're able to represent through the thermal observations the difference in, in, in the consumptive water use across these different fields. So this is just another example. Um, Martha and her team have recently been working with a winery, a Gallo in, in California, where they are trying to monitor uh, consumptive water use from their from their vineyards. And this is just an example of their vineyards here on, on, on the left, and then the, uh, the, the, the cumulative dyslexy uh, evapotranspiration. And you see there is a lot of heterogeneity across fields. Um, older fields tend to use more water, and younger fields tend to use less. Uh, but you know, this is a nice way of uh, kind of seeing um, you know, across the, the small spatial scales, uh, how different consumptive water use can be. So we'll move a little bit into the next part of the talk. Um, uh, obviously, our Alexi system it produces evapotranspiration. Um, that is related closely to drought. So uh, we have developed tools and applications um, for monitoring drought using Alexi, uh, both on the regional scale and on the global scale. And um, so essentially what our product is called is the Evaporator Stress Index, if you have not heard of it before. It's uh, essentially a, an anomaly in the ratio of actual to potential ET. So actual ET comes from Alexi model itself, and then potential or reference ET comes from a penman monteith uh, estimation. Um, so what's nice about not just looking at the actual ET, but looking at the ratio of actual to potential is the potential takes into some of the energy differences that you can see over the season so that it, it makes it a little bit easier to relate um, that ratio from beginning of growing season to the peak to the after growing season. So this is just an example of the evaporator stress index from 2012. Uh, we had a very severe drought in a large part of our central United States where there was a lot of uh, agriculture uh, grown. Um, it, was, it was a drought which uh, was a very fast developing drought. Uh, it was preceded by a very warm and hot and dry uh, spring where we rapidly depleted soil moisture uh, in the early part of the growing season. And then as kind of the, the atmosphere reacted to that, uh, to that dryness, we kind of had a, got into a cycle where the atmosphere and the land surface were feeding back. And you had very low precipitation, very hot and dry conditions. And then obviously we, we saw uh, our ESI show very, very dry anomalies in this ratio of actual potential ET. And, uh, and then we also, in the end, saw a very uh, good amount of decreased yield uh, in a lot of uh, states in the central US. So like I said, uh, ESI represents these temporal anomalies in actual to potential ET. Um, we don't require precipitation, so that makes it a lot different than other drought products that rely on precipitation. Uh, we deduce that current soil moisture state directly from the land surface temperature. Um, so, you know, that makes it a little bit more robust in areas where you may not have uh, large-scale ground-based precipitation monitoring networks. Um, obviously, in the United States, we have a lot of in-situ precipitation monitoring, but in other areas uh, of the globe, uh, having drought products that are based completely on remote sensing really help fill in where we have uh, data-poor regions. So another thing that makes uh, an LST-based uh, drought product different than some of the other drought products you see is that other drought products that rely on remote sensing a lot of times are just looking at the current vegetation state uh, using an NDVI or a leaf area index and an anomaly in, in one of those observations. Um, but what's different with LSD is that we actually see the signatures of vegetation stress in the LSD signal before we actually see any deterioration of the vegetation cover. Um, so one way of saying it is like you will start to see stress in the land surface temperature. Plants are starting to regulate their water use. We are um, 
then we see that in elevated canopy temperatures well before you see any browning in NDVI. Um, so LSD-based methods can be an effective uh, early warning of uh, impending agricultural drought. And like I said at the beginning, we, we also inherently include a lot of these non-precipitation related moisture signals, which help us get a sense of how drought is reacting to human uh, human-induced changes to, uh, especially from an agricultural standpoint, uh, some, you know, with proper irrigation, some effects of drought can be mitigated uh, during uh, especially dry uh, periods. Uh, so this is just an example. Um, I'll go through this quickly. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a busy plot, but what you're seeing here is right here is just um, from June to August, the two-week precipitation anomaly. This is the two-week ESI, uh, and then this is the change in the two-week ESI, and then this is the drought classifications from the U.S. Drought Monitor. So as you were seeing, early in June, we were seeing rapid uh, deterioration in ESI over a lot of the central U.S., and even when you're looking at the changes or how fast ESI was changing, something was really going on. Um, and so we were seeing this while, you know, we had D0, D1 classifications in the drought monitor uh, in this time. So you know, we saw essentially these, these, these rapid change in ESI, this degradation quickly, and it did precede some of the, the higher classifications that were eventually introduced in the U.S. Drought Monitor. So we have been working hard with, with end users, uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor, the National Drought Mitigation Center, uh, to get ESI integrated into their uh, decision support system so that they can have this information. Um, it's obviously easier to look at this retrospectively and say, if we had had this information, maybe we would have been introducing higher classifications earlier. Um, but as this happens in real time, there's 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 a certain sense of what's actually happening on the ground. So you know, we don't expect this to solve every problem. We don't. Uh, we, we 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 know that drought is a convergence of evidence problem. We need lots of different independent tools to get a sense of what's happening on the ground. And so providing an LSD-based tool like like the ESI will hopefully help. Uh, in, in some of these uh, scenarios where we have uh, flash droughts or rapidly developing droughts. Um, so as part of that, um, we have a, a project where it's, it's just completing. It's a NASA Applied Science project, and it's uh, also NOAA provides funding for the operational transition where we have created a, a North American ESI. Um, it's an eight kilometer spatial resolution product. Um, it's run operationally now at NOAA. There'll be uh, links to the, the products at the end of the slides. And uh, anybody who's having trouble can obviously contact Martha or I, and we'll be more than happy to get you set up um, with the data stream. Um, we're also, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, we have a prototype global version, as there are probably a lot of international uh, participants here today. Um, so our goal ultimately is to provide this product on a, on a, on a global scale. Um, but from an operational standpoint, that's several years down the line. But uh, we obviously welcome people who are interested in using the data products, at least the proto prototype data products, uh, before that. So, you know, another thing is, you know, obviously, you know, a data tool like this is good for decision makers who are trying to monitor developing drought. Um, ESI is also, we're finding it's very also predictive. Um, during certain parts of the growing season to final agricultural yields. Um, this is an example of uh, essentially soybean yields, municipal level. So we have ESI here on the uh, on the top part of these plots, and then these are the municipal level uh, soybean yields. So we're essentially looking at the anomaly or the ESI values during the, the peak of the growing season and then correlating those to final final yields. And as you see, you know, Really good correspondence, especially 2005. Southern Brazil had a pretty significant drought uh, with pretty pretty significant uh, yield anomalies. Same in 2012, um, and then some of the other years were a little bit more mixed. Um, but essentially, we're finding, you know, looking at ESI during the growing season, and as we get ESI to higher and higher resolutions, really has the benefit of starting to give a, a predictive sense for what the impact drought is having on on final agricultural. And obviously, that's an important piece of information for a lot of uh, decision makers who are trying to get ahead of market and other impacts and, and famine and other things that can happen when um, 
uh, drought conditions uh, have adverse effects on, on agricultural production. Uh, this is just another quick example. This was essentially a, a similar type of analysis in Tunisia looking at wheat yield anomalies. And obviously there's a lot of years to look at here. You guys can all go back and kind of look at. But as again, we saw good correspondence. Um, obviously the yield data here is not high, as high of a resolution as uh, the, the yield data we have from Brazil. But as you see, some of the drier years uh, in ESI we saw have good correspondence with the, the, the lower productive years uh, from, uh, from a, a wheat yield anomaly sense. So as I was saying, you know, this is kind of a, a sense where we produce ESI usually on to the 4 to 10 kilometer scale. Um, but as we are moving to higher resolutions of uh, Lotus product retrospectively and then uh, a Veer's product in the future, uh, producing uh, ESI on the 500 meter to one kilometer scale is something that we're striving for. And then that really helps us kind of to look at also stress signatures on the Landsat scale. And maybe that's even a couple more years off, but you know, that's the general direction our research team is moving. Um, obviously, when you get to these Landsat scales and looking at stress signatures, uh, things are, it's a little bit more difficult. You have to correct for uh, essentially when the crop was planted, uh, is it a corn field now and it was a soybean year before? So as we get more data and more years into our climatology, uh, we'll be able to do more at high resolutions. And that's where, once again, you know, once you get down to that field scale, the actionable information there is much greater than what we, you know, either are producing now at the, at the, at the, the regional or the, the one to five kilometer scale. So I'll go real quick, just kind of a look to the future to kind of give you a sense of uh, where our, where we're going uh, from a, a research standpoint. So one thing that has always really caused us some issues with making a global product is that while we have geostationary data over the whole globe, it comes from you know, four or five different sensors, which all have different resolutions at times, different observation times, uh, just different different issues where bringing all those together just from a data standpoint is more difficult than if we could do it with just a single sensor. Um, so this is called supplementing Alexa capabilities with polar data. Um, so polar data from MODIS, VIRS, AVHRR, um, where you have twice daily observations of LST. You have a nighttime and a daytime. And in this window here uh, in the mid-morning is essentially the, the LST rise uh, off observation that drives Alexi. We call it the Alexi window. So you see the Alexi window is within these the day minus the night difference. So what we have done is develop statistical tools, machine learning tools to take twice daily observations of LST and back out this this mid-morning rise that we need for Alexi and then we use that to drive Alexi on the global scale. The good news is the, 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 the machine learning method uh, based on tree regression, actually produces a very good estimate of the mid-morning rise because we're able to actually validate against what we see with geostationary data. Um, so this has allowed us to essentially accelerate how accelerate the development of a, of a global product, and um, in, while minimizing the amount of data that needs to go into it. So the next slide. So this is just an example. Uh, we're producing, like I said, this is a prototype. It's a five kilometer global ESI. This is the most current. We run this on a, a weekly time step that gets updated each month. Um, we obviously will, you know, go out and try to, you know, att attain funding to support a transition to operations in this. And obviously it's something that NOAA and NASA are interested in. And it's obviously it would be augmenting our, our current operational system at NOAA. But as you can see, um, it's a nice, global picture of uh, what we're looking at from an evaporative stress standpoint. And um, this year, uh, things have always been dry in, in eastern Brazil and parts of, parts of Russia and, and some, some of the other regions uh, in the western U.S. here. Um, so, if, as I said, this data we don't operationally produce, but if, if there is interest in helping us uh, validate and, and if it's an interest, just go ahead and contact us and we'd be more than happy to to share uh, the prototype data, but with the with the caveat that it's prototype data and that uh, we are co we are continually updating and, and refining the system and, and doing the validation. Uh, so another thing of looking to the future, 
which I think is even more exciting than just uh, some of the thermal-based methods we're doing, is that one of the issues with thermals, and I'll, if I go roll, roll back quick to this, this global sign, these gray areas here are areas where it's too cloudy to get a, a sufficient signal. We don't get enough clear sky retrieval as a land surface temperature to really know a sense what's going on. So in, you know, in, the, in the warm season in India, Southeast Asia, uh, parts of equatorial Africa and parts of the Amazon, we just don't have a good sense from thermal uh, what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, so there are methods of getting land surface temperature from Ka band observations or 37 gigahertz observations from microwave sensors. And we have a number of microwave sensors uh, currently flying. Um, and using essentially addition, you know, ways of taking sparse observations and then backing out the diurnal cycle of LST, um, our, colleague, our colleague Thomas Holmes has developed this method where he takes these blue dots, which are the microwave observations, and then is able to estimate, we're able to then back out that, that mid-morning rise we need from Alexi, once again, uh, from microwave sensors. And that's important because microwave sensors can see through clouds, um, at least non-precipitating clouds. Uh, so in areas of equatorial Africa, Southeast Asia, you know, during the warm season, we may get one or five uh, clear sky retrievals. With microwave, we can get 30 to 60. So, I mean, it really allows us to fill in some of that information we're missing with a thermal-only system. Uh, the caveat is it, it, it comes at a much coarser resolution, usually 15 to 30 kilometers. Um, but as you saw with, with some of the data fusion tools, we hope to find ways of using methodologies like that to downscale the microwave land surface temperature so that we're able to get some higher resolution information. And so this is important. So this is just an example. Uh, this is a uh, over over Africa where we ran here on the on the left. This is a cumulative ET from Alexi and using thermal data only. And then this is using only microwave data. So as you see here, it's very noisy here in Equatorial Africa. That's because while we get some clear sky retrievals, the the inherent um, uncertainty is high. So we get a lot of cloud contamination. That's how you get some of these pixels where you have a lot of variability, kind of a, a pixelated sense of ET. Where if you look at the microwave, you have a much more smoother um, sense of what uh, is occurring. Um, so really, and what it seems to do is that the cloud issues in, in the thermal only, really it seemed like they're underestimating ET because think about it this way, it's um, if you have a, if you have clouds in the morning and then you have a clear, so you have two times. So if you have a cloud in the morning and then you get a clear observation before local noon, it looks like a really big rise because you were seeing a much colder temperature of the cloud. And sometimes if those are low clouds or fog, they're really close to what the land surface temperature might be. So a lot of our cloud removal and some of the other statistical tools we try to do to remove cloud contamination miss it. So in the end, we overestimate, we over underestimate a lot of ET in the Ethiopian highlands, which is a very cloudy region, and then obviously parts of uh, uh, equatorial Africa. So as you see, this is a really interesting method that we've been developing and uh, we continue to refine. And um, once we get around to kind of operationally producing the land surface temperature from microwave, we can then start to figure out ways of getting this more into the operational system that drives Alexi. And this is just another example of this, the, the, the thermal versus the microwave from an ESI standpoint. Up here is the thermal. And then down here is the microwave, and this is the 2011 drought in, in South Texas, New Mexico. And as you see, the two methods provide generally the same answer, and that's what we're really worried about. Um, because it's a, the microwave land surface temperature, because of the way that we have to use the sparse observations, we would like to know that it's getting the same anomaly signal. And that's what, essentially what we're seeing here in, in some of our first validation analysis of this microwave product. So I will close there. Um, I think the, the, the take-home message is that LST-based evapotranspiration um, is a diagnostic method. It, it augments prognostic methods, um, but while capturing some of these non-precipitation-related moisture sources as ore sinks, um, uh, Lexi, Dyslexi, we have the capability to map from global to sub-field scales uh, using data fusion, and uh, it can be combined with other remotely sensed soil moisture and precipitation data to try to interpret changes in, in other hydrological variables. So 
we're always finding new applications. We get we always get different requests for data from people that we didn't think that our data had a, a purpose. Um, but you know that's kind of what we, we strive to is uh, moving now that we have a robust model. Um, I think our research team is really moving more into applications. Uh, it's very important for us to get at consumptive water use, especially in arid regions that are semi-arid and rely on irrigation. Um, and as population growth continues, we need to find ways to more effectively use water while still growing more crop. Um, so at that point, I will pass it back to Amita. And then I guess I will take questions at the end, I believe. OK, so that was um, Chris Hain. And this brings us to the second part of today's session. Uh, this session will focus on evapotranspiration and soil moisture data from land data assimilation uh, systems and then also a demonstration of how to get these data and use them in QGIS. So um, earlier we have talked about, um, especially for evapotranspiration, we have talked about uh, different kinds of methods to estimate ET, uh, such as water balance and energy balance um, uh, methods. So the two that we saw earlier, Matrix and Alexi that uh, Chris just presented, they are both based on er surface energy balance um, method. Now, uh, the land data assimilation models, they are really a sophisticated numerical models that provide um, land surface data or um, integrated output of water parameters based on inputs uh, that satisfy both water and energy balance at the surface. So here is a brief uh, description of these uh, L GLDAS and L NLDAS models that we're going to uh, look at today. Um, this is the website where detailed information of land data assimilation uh, systems are provided. Um, there are two models, uh, Global Land Data Assimilation System and North American Land Data Assimilation System. Um, both uh, have uh, sophisticated models and they use inputs from uh, different sources that we will see uh, shortly. But uh, this site provides um, very detailed information and uh, also how future development is going to go for these models that's described here. Um, so we're going to briefly look at uh, what these systems are. So NL does, um, it's really focused on North American uh, continent as the name, name suggests. Uh, the model currently, they have four different land surface model versions. Uh, namely Mosaic, NOAA, uh, SAC, and VIC. Um, these two are, they use different uh, land surface parameterizations, but all these versions, they use the uh, same inputs. These inputs force this model, and uh, over North America, where there is very good surface uh, data coverage, uh, inputs are based on precipitation from NOAA uh, climate Prediction Center, rain gauges, uh, meteorological data are available from North American Regional Reanalysis or NAR. Uh, also, uh, surface uh, shortwave radiation data, which drive these models, they are also obtained from NAR, uh, but they're adjusted with uh, GO satellite bias correction uh, in, in the um, shortwave radiation. Uh, this provides uh, integrated output of many parameters um, and soil moisture and evapotranspiration, uh, they are part of the input uh, output data. So um, the, the right hand side here that shows uh, next phase of NLDAS. So currently, as you can see here, um, the data uh, are mostly coming from reanalysis. In here, which is the land information system or LIS-based LIS uh, NLDAS, will have uh, satellite-based environmental information, including um, soil moisture from SMAP will be assimilated in here. Um, snow data also will be coming from um, different uh, satellite uh, information. So this will be the next version of um, NLDAS. Currently, however, 
uh, NLDAS is available um, in these two land surface modeling with these inputs. Global land data assimilation system um, again has four different land surface model versions. Um, three are the same, such as NOAA, uh, Mosaic, and VIC, and or WIC, and CLM2. Uh, these are the four different models or parameterization techniques that GLDAS uses. What you can see here is that inputs are, are different than NLDAS uh, because over um, North America, there are quite a few land-based observations available, also operational analysis, which is high resolution that is also available. Uh, over global domain, um, it is not possible to get detailed surface weight observations. So these uh, GLDAS models, they use uh, satellite input uh, more than NLDAS does, such as rainfall from a trim and multi-satellite based algorithms such as TMPA um, is used. Um, also meteorological data are based on global reanalysis that comes from Princeton University uh, with, in which uh, whatever observational data are available are assimilated. Uh, in GLDAS, vegetation information such as land, uh, LA, uh, leaf area index, vegetation mass, land water mass, they are based on MODIS satellite. And clouds and snow information are obtained from NOAA and Defense Meteorological uh, Satellite uh, System. GLDAS also provides um, output which has hydrologic parameters which cannot be directly observed, but they, they are calculated here um, based on both energy and water balance. So evapotranspiration and soil moisture, uh, they are available from GLDAS as well. So here is a summary of LDAS data available um, from NASA Web Tools. If you see the LDAS website that was shown earlier, you will find a way to FTP uh, data directly, and these data are in GRIB format. However, these NASA tools, such as Giovanni and Mirador, they allow um, subsetting and converting format of GLDAS and NLDAS data for easier usage. So um, GLDAS, NOVA, uh, and data and WIC data are available uh, from both Mirador and Giovanni. Similarly, NLDAS data, both NOAA and WIC, these are available from Mirador and Giovanni currently. As you can see, GLDAS data are available at one fourth to one degree resolution. Uh, they're global data. They're available at three hourly and monthly temporal resolution. The um, version that is extended to present, there are two versions, NOAA and WIC. Uh, one is going from 1979 to present, the other from 2000 to present. Uh, NLDAS, um, NOAA and WIC, they are available from 1979 to present. Special resolution is uh, a bit higher here, one eighth of a degree um, to one degree, and temporal resolution is one hour and also monthly. So these data can be obtained from Mirador and Giovanni. So next part here will uh, show um, a demonstration of how to access these data. Um, so first, what we will see is get GLDAS data. Uh, we'll focus on evapotranspiration uh, and soil moisture here from Mirador. And then next one will be again NLDAS data uh, using Giovanni, and then we'll see how to get this data into QGIS. So I'm going to share my screen and show um, some of these tools how to get GLDAS and NLDAS data. So please uh, bear with me while I share my screen with you. So hope you all can see my screen here, which is looking at Mirador. Um, and here is the website, miradorgsfcnasa.gov. When you go to this website, you will see a um, interface here, which is interactive. 
and has uh, multiple way of choosing data. If you look on the left hand side, you can see uh, data holdings or clicking on that will give you a list of data that are available from Mirador. A uh, more easier or way is to go to keyword search. If you know the data set you are looking for, you can enter the name. And here I have entered GLDAS. Um, another uh, option here is to choose temporally subset, it, subset the data. So as we saw, the data are av available for multiple years. If you want to just look at small part of it, you can pick time span. So this is the beginning. Uh, date and uh, you can either enter year, month, and uh, day here, or you can choose through the calendar both uh, starting date and end date. So here I have chosen month of July of 2016 uh, for an example, and we're look, going to look at monthly data, uh, but you can choose uh, three hourly data which are available from GLDAS as well. For special uh, selection, the data are global, but if you're interested in a small region, you can enter latitude longitude box as shown here, or you can click on this box and choose the area that you are interested in. Um, here, I'm just choosing North America, uh, for example, uh, but what you can do is choose any area you like, and then you can search GS disk. Once you do that, it will take you to uh, all the files or data available under uh, GLDAS keyword. And as you can see here, um, there is, this is land surface model. We are looking for monthly uh, week data. So this is GLDAS hourly and week hourly and monthly land surface model. So you can pick the data that you're looking for. Uh, you can have information about this. You can have um, what kind of data are there, where, what are the citation, the documentation of data, so you can see where to get more information about it. Um, once you uh, select a data set that you want to look at, you can view files. And um, as you can see, this already lists a number of parameters available in this particular data set, and that includes um, evapotranspiration as well as uh, soil moisture. So when you click on view files, here we just picked one month, uh, July 2016, and you can see that uh, is available in grid format, .grb. However, um, you, if, it is easier to work with either GIS or other software. You may want to save it as NetCDF. Uh, so uh, there are two ways to save this file. Once of, you can click on this, and it allows you to save as NetCDF file. And it's working on it right now, as I can see here. Okay. It, can, it will ask you to save this file, and you can save this file just by clicking. And um, another way, if you have multiple files, suppose you picked more than one month, or you have three hourly data and you have multiple files, and you wish not to click on each file individually, you can select all uh, the files on this page, and then add selected files to cart. This will stack all the files that you have selected into this cart, and then you can continue to uh, check out. Uh, here it also indicates that you have subsetted this um, data specially, and uh, you can continue checking. So here it shows a list of files, here we have just chosen one month, so it shows one file. But if you have multiple files, you see a list of files that you have requested for uh, downloading, and then you can say checkout. This takes you to a checkout page, uh, which where all the files that you have requested 
will appear in this URL list shown here. And there are, depending on the operating system of your computer, you can either use wget or you can use Unix curl um, command to download um, all the files. And if you go through uh, both these sections, you will know how to uh, use wget or curl to download the file. So all the information is available here. There are more options for direct FTP SL as well. And if you go um, uh, to uh, this URL list, you will see that the file that you requested is here. So this is the way to look at uh, Mirador uh, and select data by keyword, uh, do special subsetting and temporal subsetting. You can convert format um, into NetCDF. Uh, in most cases, uh, you, you can also go to OpenDAP and save as ASCII in some data sets. Uh, GLDAS, NLDAS, both can be saved as NetCDF here. Either you can click on individual files and download, but for batch download or bulk download, Mirador is quite useful that you can choose a number of files over a long time period, um, check them out in the cart, and then uh, download them either by using wget or curl uh, command as shown here. So next, what we want to see is, um, want to see Geomani. This is another tool that allows you not only uh, selection of data, but also visual analysis of data is, uh, uh, can be done by using Geomani. Uh, again, the uh, URL is given here, web address. Uh, if you see there are multiple things to see here. First of all, keyword search facilities here as well. Since we are going to look at example of NLDAS, I've already entered NLDAS and VIC to narrow down the search. Um, but you can go on this left-hand side and if you don't know which keyword to use, you can choose by parameters as shown here in the left-hand side. You can choose evapotranspiration or evaporation or soil moisture through here too and it takes you to all the available products. So once you uh, select the parameter, um, you will find out the uh, beginning and end date of the data available. Uh, special resolution and temporal resolutions are also available for each uh, parameter. So then you can pick, pick the time you want to look at. Again, uh, for example, we have chosen July, uh, 2016 here, uh, just as in case of GLDAS. And we've chosen here the um, entire domain of North America, but in Giovanni, you can also choose files by you know, state by state. So there are shape files available for all the states of the United States that you can pick, and then you can clip the domain according to these shape files. Uh, if you're looking at global data, then there are different countries uh, are available as shapefile and you can focus on a particular country. Uh, another way to choose is by watersheds. So major river basins are given here and you can choose shapefile for um, these river basins as well to focus on that uh, area. So here this is uh, we are going to look at the entire region available from NLDAS. So um, you can also look at a map and then you can draw a box and choose um, on the map as well, so the region you're interested in. So in here, uh, in, in Mirador, you had um, GLDAS or NLDAS files, they combine all the parameters. Here you can um, choose from individual parameters such as here, total evapotranspiration is already separated for you to download and soil moisture data are also available here separately. So layer one, which is top 10 centimeter um, uh, in the model. So these two data we've already chosen, monthly and one eighth degree uh, data we're looking at for July, uh, 2016. Once you choose or make your selection, you can say plot data. 
So we have chosen to plot maps here, but you can also um, do other analysis as we will see in a minute. So it, it is working on producing the maps. And once it is done, you will see soil moisture and evapotranspiration maps here. You can also see here um, to zoom in, you can use this plus sign. And using this arrow, you can uh, pan the map and go to the area you want to. Another option is to change um, color as shown here. You can choose um, to highlight any um, range you like. You can choose different color table if you like. And say replot. So it replots. Um, the parameter you have chosen with the range and colors you have chosen. So this is an easy way to analyze data online before even downloading. And I just want to point out here on top that you can have, we are looking at monthly map, but you can animate data or you can have difference of time averaged maps. You can have accumulated quantities such as precipitation, uh, and you can have climatological maps. You can define climatology and look at map as well. Another way to uh, look at data is in terms of correlation or scatter plot. So statistical analysis can be done on data. And you can also do time series. Um, so average um, any parameter over uh, some area that you have chosen. You can do seasonal time series as well. and latitudinal and time averaged and longitude and time average of Mueller diagrams can also be done. So Giovanni is not just data downloading, but it also has a facility to um, look, look to get the uh, data analysis done before you download. Uh, once you are certain that you want to download the data, here are options. Uh, of downloading data in different formats. So as you can see, uh, soil moisture and evapotranspiration data from NLDAS are available in NetCDF format. Uh, they are available as PNG images. They are also available at GeoTIFF images, which can go directly into um, ArcMap or um, QGIS. Or, uh, you can also download these same files as KMZ files, which you can view with the help of uh, Google Earth, so Google Maps. So these are different formats that for different applications you may want to download um, in this format. So again, we saw Mirador for bulk data download, Giovanni for analyzing data, for visualizing data, and downloading in many different formats. So this brings us to the last section of this demonstration in which we are going to look at QGIS uh, file. Uh, bear with me while I start QGIS. Here you can see you you we have um, on our website there is information about how to download QGIS. This is a open um, software, so it's free. Um, and what we want to see is once you save any data into NetCDF or GeoTIFF format, how to uh, look at this data in QGIS or how to import it. So just for reference, you can go to website web option here and download um, any background map of your liking. I have chosen open uh, street map here. Uh, once you have downloaded the files from using either Mirador or Giovanni, you can add them into QGIS. So here is an option to add a raster layer. So you can click on the raster layer and you can choose either um, 
see evapotranspiration or soil moisture um, both are available here you can open evapotranspiration and also add soil moisture that we downloaded from um, NLDAS using Giovanni. So now what you see here is just uh, data as black and white, but you can um, manipulate layer properties to get this in proper color. Uh, you can zoom into the region you like and also Once you do this, you can work with the layer properties. Um, if you go to layer and pick properties, you can choose uh, style. Um, what you want to do is choose single band pseudo color. This provides different color tables. Also, it can provide a mode of viewing the data and I'm choosing equal interval data with say 10 intervals. Um, this shows minimum and maximum value of the data that we are looking at um, and you can classify so this gives you the color table range and data which color is which and once you apply that hmm. start again. Sorry about that. Okay, so it is, um, let me go back to what it should look like. So once you have, um, you go through those steps, what you will see is that you have, um, you can do the same for evapotranspiration and soil moisture and you can view uh, each layer one at a time. So this is, um, this, this one is showing soil moisture with uh, these uh, color ranges. So this is in kilogram per meter square and this then shows evapotranspiration uh, for, the, uh, for the same month. So you can view this um, with uh, different layers such as vegetation or terrain or um, anything. You can also use uh, features from the layer which are, uh, you can make it transparent if you like, uh, change the transparency of um, the layer. Um, and um, uh, make it more transparent so you can see the landmarks underneath. Um, so, so this is basically how you would work in QGIS. You can also do the same with the GLDAS file that we you saved from Mirador and view through QGIS, uh, which will focus, if you have picked any different area of the globe, you can view that in QGIS as well. So this um, is a quick way of downloading data and looking with QGIS. And if you have any other additional layers you want to analyze along with, you can uh, use that. So this ends the demonstration of Mirador Giovanni and um, QGIS uh, using GLDAS and NLDAS evapotranspiration and soil moisture data. So I'm going to go back to the presentation to conclude this session. So these are some of the slides you will find in the presentations which go through all the steps that I just demonstrated using Mirador uh, to download GLDAS data um, and Giovanni to um, search and download the data. Um, 
So everything that we talked about is also given here in the slides. Also goes through the QGIS steps, uh, how to change layer properties, and uh, how to analyze data. So this bring, brings us to the concluding part of this um, webinar. We had five sessions, as you know. Um, we started with soil moisture active passive mission overview. Um, we also had a couple of talks in which SMAP applications were discussed in agriculture, flood and drought monitoring, weather and climate forecasting, and human health. Um, we had a session in which there was a demonstration of how to access soil moisture active passive data uh, from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. Uh, last week, we had a um, presentation about metric evapotranspiration estimation based on Landsat data and uh, also a demonstration of EE flux, how to access this data. Today, we had a presentation by Chris Hain on uh, Alexi, which is a uh, evapotranspiration estimate estimation based on MODIS, GOES, and fusion data. And he also talked about um, their site where over the US evapotranspiration stress index is av available. Um, and they're working on the global data, as he mentioned. Uh, we also uh, quickly saw uh, land data assimilation uh, models, which provide soil moisture and evapotranspiration data. Um, and we, we had a demonstration of Mirador and Giovanni in QGIS to work with these data sets. So this uh, concludes this uh, webinar series. So we thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, here is the RSET listserv. If you haven't uh, joined it, uh, please join it. We